So um, let me give you a little bit of background about myself and my approach to badges. Um, I first got acquainted with badges at Purdue University when I worked in educational assessment. Um, as many of you know, that's where uh, they started kind of the homegrown badges system. Um, passport and I got familiar with it in 2012, 2013, something like that. And then uh, went to work for Dan Hickey at Indiana University um, in a research lab by the Brentley Foundation to help build high quality badges in a higher ed and uh, vocational aspect. So um, I've been doing badges now for a number of years and uh, a lot of the work that I have done has been a little bit more conceptual. Um, I've been in the pits of building high quality evidence, but a lot of the stuff that I do is kind of philosophically based. Um, as well as conceptual. So hopefully, um, if I'm successful today, um, I will give you um, some food for thought and some different approaches to think about. Okay. Okay. So it's wonderful being in the presence of people that I don't have to spend the first 10 minutes explaining what a badge is. So let me begin by explaining exactly why I think badges are interesting. Um, so unlike the internet, they're democratizing, which means that people don't have control over them. Um, now, as many of you know, that means that badges can be um, unpredictable, uncontrollable. Um, it also means that by not having a central authority or power or a creditor or something like this, there are plenty of examples of really bad badges. Um, it's funny that in the badge world, we tend to um, kind of go to the bro badge, um, which you might be familiar with, out of the gaming world where it requires luck to get the badge, and it requires no evidence and nothing, and the uh, horrible world badge is kind of the, uh, the bottom of the barrel. Um, but that's what happens when you make something free, when you make it available, when you, when you give this power to people. So one of the things that I find really interesting about kind of the democratizing of this is that you don't know what's going to come from it, that it's uncontrollable. Um, and from that, you get a lot of innovative uses. And there's a lot of uh, people, there are a lot of people that are using badges in really cool, innovative ways um, and new processes and new ways of, of credentialing are emerging. Um, and that's happening every day. So a quick example is there's been some discussion underway about using blockchain and badges. Uh, and some people are beginning to do this now. And it's really fascinating to watch this stuff emerge innovatively. So with this, we're having kind of a redefinition and kind of having to talk about what it means to say that a person is credentialed and what it means in the 21st century to have a credentialed person how to continually be credentialed. So some more of what I find particularly interesting about this um, is that the if you use badges on social media like LinkedIn, um, you know, these are very simple plugins now for most badge providers where you just click, you know, put it on LinkedIn, there you go. Um, what this is doing is it's in some ways making, or you could even say maybe even relegating college to being that first step into adulthood but it's kind of understood at this point that, that a person has to be continually educated, that the job that you may do when you're 60 nearing retirement, or hopefully retirement, I don't know if that's going to continue, but uh, nearing retirement is fundamentally different and requires fundamentally different skills than 40 years prior when uh, the person may have finished college. So this is creating different transcripts. It's creating different ways of thinking about it. And when you get people like Stanford University, uh, the registrar, who are interested in figuring out how to do badges, put badges on a transcript, and have the Stanford name behind it, um, that's really interesting. And there's a number of registrars around the country that are trying to figure this, this piece out right now, of putting the veracity of the university behind the learning and the evidence that goes into it. So, What's, uh, another thing that I find particularly interesting here is that ed psych people are really, really negative about face validity, and for good reason. Um, but badges are kind of reviving this, and they're showing how face validity is important. Because if you drill into a badge, and it doesn't have good evidence, and it doesn't have something that's on its face to show that there is something really interesting going on here, they don't pay attention to it. So face validity becomes kind of a stopgap. Uh, for badges. In, in an ed psych and a psychometric way of looking at it, uh, kind of using face validity for perhaps something really interesting for the first time uh, is something that I'm very interested in. And also that this is um, not only just something that's socially constructed as learning, but also that is socially verified. So LinkedIn has kind of pulled in this, this idea of having endorsements and, and up-clicking and that sort of thing, but it's very limited. So a person can go in and endorse someone but not have to offer any reason why. They can just hit plus one. Um, whereas a badge with endorsement, 
oftentimes you want people to add as to why they find that that person is particularly competent or skilled in something. But also, and, and this is what I'm going to focus on today, is how we can talk about um, you know, this rapidly changing workforce and how badges can be used, particularly in STEM, as retraining and training and learning new skills and staying ahead of that curve instead of being washed under. So the problem that I've identified, um, and again, I, I in some ways apologize that a lot of times my slide decks are kind of the, uh, the very lengthy laundry list of all the stuff that's been floating around my head about how we can do things differently or what else we can talk about. Um, what I'm trying to do is consolidate some of these ideas that I've been tinkering around with for a while. So the problem that I've identified when we talk about is how STEM education, um, it does play an important part in um, how we are progressing with technology. We need kids that are educated in math, science, engineering, technology to be able to jump in and make innovative but yet also profitable um, new technologies. However, with that comes uh, this idea of automation and artificial intelligence, which I'll define in a moment. Um, and there's this competing tension when we talk about the human workforce that this leads to job losses, increased outsourcing, and shifting economies. Um, to this point, I probably have said nothing that you haven't already thought of yourself. Um, I think at this point, it's fairly well accepted that in some capacity, artificial intelligence and automation are changing the workforce and will continue to do so. So the argument that I'm trying to make here is, is that STEM students and vocational um, learners can benefit from emerging micro-credentialing opportunities. Um, and a quick example of this is, is that there's some markets that are emerging that offer badges as credentials that a student can pay for and get a short course learning and then get an evidence-rich credential to go with it. That changes a lot in education. So badges can evidence the claims to demonstrable competencies and a variety of skills that can complement and expand workforce capability. So instead of being washed under with automation or artificial intelligence, there's the capacity here to do something really innovative, which frankly, in this, the scope of human intelligence is what we do well. So virtual learning environments, the only, um, what you guys have been talking about for several days, this offers additional opportunities. And at the end of this talk, I'm going to talk about how we can move this into um, kind of the realm of where the rubber hits the road and provide evidence of learning in advanced fields. So the argument that I'm making is that digital badges connect VLE experiences with specific claims to learn and remain ahead of automation and, and artificial intelligence. Okay, so when I say the term shifting economics, um, what I'm talking about here are some major financial and social drivers in, in a so-called knowledge economy. Uh, this is a term that has emerged in the last decade or two, um, really kind of at the pace of technology, saying that it's no longer necessarily what you do with your back, it's what you're able to do with your mind and that having knowledge is fundamentally important to remaining relevant and uh, useful in the workplace. And, you know, it's no big thing to say that technology is growing at a rapid pace. You know, on the scale of things, I'm not sure that it's moving at quite the same pace that it did in the 20th century, but let's face it, I mean, we all have these sitting in our pockets, and, you know, that is more computing power than they went to the moon with. So it's moving quickly. So with that, you have speed, um, streamlining, and scaling automation becoming key economic motivators. And I found this fun little graph that talks about the risk of being replaced. So there's actually all these consulting companies out there now that will try to give you a number as to how, you know, how much at risk your, your uh, job is for being replaced. So for example, truck drivers uh, may well be replaced very soon uh, with automatic driving trucks, which is kind of terrifying. But anyway, uh, one of the ones that's ranked lowest uh, that I found kind of funny is clergy. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll save the jokes. Okay, so a good example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, this quote was published recently in a McKinsey quarterly report. In 1990, the top three automakers in Detroit had among them nominal revenues of $250 billion, a market capitalization of $36 billion, and 1.2 million employees. The top three companies in Silicon Valley in 2014 had nominal revenues of about the same amount of money, a market capitalization of over one trillion, and only 137,000 employees. That is huge. That is an enormous difference. So in the space of just over 20 years, uh, there's been a huge kind of move and shift in economy. So just a couple quick definitions of how um, I view automation and AI, and I'm sure many of you will probably take issue with these. I'm not looking at this to be a technical definition so much as just a functional definition. Um, so automation, the way that I think about it, is that this is replacing work that's done by humans um, who have had 
in, in increasing with machine driven processes. So essentially, machines replacing the work of humans did. This is, uh, became an enormous problem in Detroit when machines replaced workers on the line. So artificial intelligence, the way that I'm looking at this is kind of a complex processing to compute information in a complex network that's similar to a human mind, but probably a little bit more focused. Um, you know, the, the old joke of like, oh, look, squirrel. Right? Um, when you design a machine that can do that, you don't have the same distraction that we do, and that's especially useful in the workforce. But the effect, I think, is the same. So again, not to draw too many direct connections between automation and AI. But I think the effect is kind of the same, particularly when we're talking about the human behind it, is that you have a displaced, unemployed, and perhaps even depressed worker. Um, I think we're beginning to see some of the effects of that now as our economy moves very much from kind of post-industrialization into this kind of strange knowledge-based economy um, where STEM education is very much driven um, as, a, as a force behind it. So I think one thing that kind of, um, kind of illustrates this maybe in a slightly different way is that there's been a lot of technology um, interests amongst leaders talking about universal basic income, UBI. Um, this is the idea that every person in the country would receive some basic amount of income um, to be able to pay basic bills, groceries, and things like this, and then if you want more money, then you work for it. Uh, so this means that we could essentially spend our lives doing what we want to, and we would be able to make ends meet. And then if you want to make more money, you have the option of doing so. Um, I'm not an economist. I'm not going to go into like the, the pieces behind that or whether or not that would actually work. But I think what's interesting is that it's being driven by the technology field almost as kind of a moral absolution. They realize that what they're doing is they're replacing jobs. And by really pushing this kind of old economic idea and, and retooling it, what they're doing is, is in a sense making moral absolution for what they know that they're doing. OK, uh, but we'll withhold judgment. So uh, another way that I'm looking at this in terms of education is that you know, whereas education was once you know, a key to maintaining a place of economic and social privilege, um, it was also calcified, and I'm thinking primarily of education from I don't know, the mid to late 1800s until relatively recently, sort of prior to the end. Um, and this was a place of, of where a person who was privileged could remain privileged and have a key um, economic piece to remain in a privileged case. But that, in the last 20 years, particularly with the rise of the internet and online education, has kind of flipped that, and that's continuing to change. And in some ways, we're, we're living the effects of that right now, and that will only continue. Um, just the fact that we're even connected up today would have been unthinkable just a few decades ago. Um, so again, there's some shifting priorities here between post-industrialization and the knowledge economy. Um, so education as we're thinking of it now is not just like, oh, you're 22 and you graduate, you're done, awesome. Um, this is, I, I think, something where we're driving this idea that um, to remain relevant, to remain, um, to get promoted in the workforce, means that you have to stay with and relevant to a changing economy. Um, for those of us that, and I, I fall into this camp myself, like to view education for the sake of being educated, and in many ways that kind of betrays a certain privilege um, of being able to say, well, isn't it great to be educated simply because it allows you to be an educated person? Um, I think that that world, in, in some ways, is, is going away very quickly. Um, but with this, and what's needed, what emerges out of these, these changes is a rise in alternative credentials. Badges are one part of that. Um, you also have this kind of, um, I, I say ideology, but I mean that in a very neutral way of lifelong learning, of assuming that once you reach the end of your formal education, you're really not done, and that you really have to keep learning along the way. Um, and then with this, and I referenced it before, there's a number of, of um, organizations that are moving into selling credentials and selling assessment. So STEM education uh, encourages connecting the success in the knowledge-driven economy and the technical skills. So in many ways, STEM education is a really fantastic way of looking at badges uh, because it connects all of these things together. So even though we have um, this loss of jobs and increased outsourcing and shift in economies, that means that there's also this impetus to change and for humans to be not as um, comfortable in the ways that we work. So an example of this is, is that we've just now begun having automatic programmers, um, software programmers. Um, what that means is that there are forms of fairly rudimentary, um, but automated forms of being able to do programming. That means the programmers themselves have to learn new languages, they have to learn new techniques, they have to learn new um, strategies to do their work, um, and they have to stay on top of it. 
We have health. Uh, we have robots in healthcare. We have tracking mechanisms. Um, frankly, my my own physician thought it was funny that I knew that uh, many of the outcomes that are that she is assessed on actually come from tracking the uh, long term um, data points. So every time I go to the doctor's office, they they want to do an A one C test on my blood sugar just to show some sort of measurement across time. Um, she wasn't particularly thrilled the last time when I insisted that, you know, well, you're going to pay for that. It has to do with your pay. Yeah, I, I'm just that guy. Okay, so um, I heard a couple chuckles up to it. So a deeper dive here. Um, I think that this is going to change mo many people, if not most people, particularly in the coming decades. And I think that the sooner that we begin to figure this out, um, how we can connect STEM education, particularly with, with something as, as rich as badges, the better off we'll be. So I think the solution here is, is to really kind of exploit that thing that we do best as humans. We develop these technologies, but then we figure out how to use them better and to make our lives better and in some cases worse, I mean, let's be honest. But humans find their place in between the technology and themselves. And I think that with this, you get a certain amount of creativity and ingenuity and productivity um, that even though maybe the first part of this presentation is sound kind of depressing, I really don't mean it like that. Um, in some ways, I, I think that this is good because it keeps us on our toes and it makes it so that we have to adapt quickly and we have to be able uh, to move at, the, at the, this change of pace. So looking at this as kind of a, a, as an economic salve, I think, is, is important here. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that there's it's kind of like, um, if any of you are familiar with the philosophical concept of the pharmacon, what that means is, is that when you go to a pharmacy, when you get a medication, that medication is doing something for you, but there are always side effects. So that medication, in some ways, is helping you, but it's also hurting you. That in some ways, like for example, if you take an antibiotic, it's also a poison. Um, it's poisoning something specific, but it's also a poison. So when we talk about things being an economic salad, what we're also talking about here is a bit of pharmacon. So this is good, but it's also bad. There are unintended consequences with it. But I think the more we get this out there, the more we talk about it now, the better off we'll be in the long run. So there's this interesting space between formal education and formal credentials. And that is really what, what, where things are at right now. Um, and this idea that we can offer persistent um, artifacts that can live on in time um, really offers something really quite different than the standard flat transcript like we've had for many, many years. So a good example of this is my uh, former boss, Dan Hickey, at Indiana University. He offers a MOOC, uh, sorry, a MOOC. That's a big open online course. So unlike a MOOC that's massive, he offers ones that are intended at 100 or less. He calls those big, a MOOC on educational assessment. And within that, he offers evidence-rich badges. And you'll notice from the design, the badges look kind of weird, and that's done on purpose. Because you're immediately, you look at that and you're like, why is there a green man here? But when you click on it, what you see is a bunch of evidence that comes, for, comes with it. And in my opinion, this is a great example of how a badge can transform education. So students that take his book are able to earn these credentials. Uh, we saw examples of doctoral students that needed to supplement their education in slightly different ways than they were getting in their formal education. They took his book, they got this evidence rich credential, they put it on their LinkedIn account, and then they were even more attracted to the organizations and the schools that they were applying to after them. So um, if we look at this as a way to fill gaps and find the on-ramps to good badges, um, their badges are emerging in workforce training. They're emerging in short course credential registries, courses that can be completed in a number of weeks. Um, and there's also some uh, examples of others using this in vocational continuing education. Some examples of this are like Wonderlick and Nocti. Uh, they're both issuing badges. They're, they're different organizations, but they offer credit for prior learning. They offer assessment of skills in particular fields. Um, you have the University of Wisconsin Extension, which, is, which has partnered with UCLA and UC Irvine, I think, and a lot of other schools to offer this, this short, short, short course um, credentialing. We also have Deacon Co. in um, Australia that is doing this too. And they've been in this space for several years now of saying the university, in this case Deakin University, offers high quality education, high quality credentials, and they've moved that into the badger space. So for those of you that may know Doug Belshaw, you just know that I have to include um, his profile here because he's awesome. Um, but this is a good example of what it looks like when someone takes a badge and puts it into their LinkedIn account. It becomes a very public, very open, 
um, very credible thing of saying, these are the skills that I have, and here's the evidence to prove it. So not only do I have this transcript that you can be rest assured that I know something from X university, but look at the evidence of where I've gone out to prove that I know these particular skills. So if we look at this in terms of STEM, um, badges are helping to show um, additional skill gain, additional relevance, um, updated training. I have here a couple of examples from Oracle, from Autodesk, from SAS. Um, organizations realize that there is really a lot of potential here for credentialing um, certifications, so it can be computer certifications, it can be um, a number of software applications, um, professionals of all different stripes, they can have these certifications, they can go out into LinkedIn, or they can do them private and send them by email. Um, but this is a demonstrable way of being able to show that they have uh, been credentialed or are getting further credentials. So badges can help us keep up with the pace of technological innovation. Um, they help us to be able to um, contextualize what is being changed in our economies and different ways of being able to adapt to it. Um, when Microsoft and IBM jumped into the badging space, um, there's a lot of excitement about how um, this could potentially change it because they have the resources, they have the money, they have the time, they have the people to be able to develop these things in, in a very uh, intensive way. Um, I can tell you, I can't name names, but there are a number of organizations that big organizations that are really looking seriously at badges and how to do them well. Which, as you all know, is, is the key to doing them well. Um, okay, so if we look at this in terms of training, uh, this is also an extension into other domains. So as we all know, we're, we're encouraged to specialize, and the more educated we get, typically the more specialized we are in a particular field. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, but as this applies to the workspace, it also requires a certain amount of generalization and skills adaptation. Um, for example, if you have a worker, you know, there's kind of this presumption that a professional should have a working knowledge of a lot of different types of software, and it's assumed at this point. And if you don't know those, then you can quickly get behind. So badges offer a way to be able to, within a very short amount of time, move into other other domains. And with a fairly low risk, you know, if we're only talking a minimal amount of money and a minimal amount of time, someone can venture into another domain, learn those skills, get credentialed for them, and have relatively low risk involved in it. Unlike going to a university and enrolling in a two-year, four-year, or more program that entails a fair amount of risk, especially financial risk and time risk, the short course badge can upskill or reskill someone very quickly. Um, immediately coming to mind, I would say that some of the fields that are either being replaced by automation or will be in the short course um, are going to find some great potential projects and, and opportunities with badges to help people re enter the workforce and re enter it in a way that they're able to upskill very quickly and very efficiently. Um, I would say that this will increase, and I think that this will even get more popular amongst um, working professionals, particularly in STEM. So in this emerging economic situation, we're encouraging workers to be flexible, trainable, focused, um, and, and probably the most important, unafraid of having to change rapidly. Unfortunately, that's one of the things that, that as humans do really, really badly, is change <laughs> and adapt to change. Um, so I have kind of the, the unofficial Marines um, slogan here, improvise, adapt, and overcome. This is very much, I think, applicable to where we are in our current and emerging economy, particularly as it relates to STEM. We have to be able to adapt and understand automation and AI, but then we have to be able to overcome it. We have to apply what is best about the human mind and the human capacity to learn and be creative and put that in and use something like badges to do it even better. So, I would theorize here that skills are changing from what we can do to what we can learn and create. Thankfully, right now, those are fairly limited in what a machine can do. Um, and I say that right now because I'm not going to venture into the sci-fi scary stuff, but you know, at the moment, this is what we do best. We do learn, we do well by staring out the window and thinking about concepts and thinking about ways that we can create new stuff. So what I'm really interested in is how we can take STEM education and move it into this field of saying, well, let's just automate what we can, monitor it, do cool things with it, but then free people up to do imaginative, creative things. So I think that we're going to find that skills are being refined, and that is being done with specific programs. I have an example here of Colorado State University. They have an extension program that um, is similar yet different than the UW extension system. But in Colorado, they have very specific programs that people can go and do short course credentialing in. 
and they have high quality badges. And the fellow that's there that's headed this up has done this for a number of years. And I think that you'll find um, that these are continually being refined and that these will become more and more popular. So what I'm suggesting, uh, especially as we talk about economic South, is that this is not only a cultural change, it's an educational change too. In some ways it takes away from the university, from the formal university. And we're seeing some of those tensions play out now. Um, I'll give you a quick example. There's a master's degree at Concordia University um, in the, I think it's the MSEW or, or MSED program that began issuing badges as being the, essentially the transcripts. And their accreditor, they kind of got into like, uh, do we really want to do that? Um, because the accreditor had some issues with it. But eventually, and the way that I understand the program now is that that's okay. Um, and that that's been um, accepted and Concordia has issued badges in this particular program that are evidence for credentials. Um, and they're okay with it. But that is an instance of where that first ran up against an accreditor who was like, wait, you want to do what? Right? Because it was completely different than everything they had been done prior. So there is an attitude change on your way here. So as we think about credentials, not only kind of the, the, what is deemed as being like soft skills and you know, leadership and that kind of thing, but also into what you might call hard skills that are very applicable to STEM programs, there is this fundamental attitude change. So again, to reiterate, this, it, this can function as an on-ramp to get people doing different stuff, learning different things. Um, because as you all well know, even if you learn something like, let's say in college, that you think, okay, th when, when am I ever going to use this? And then later on, a decade or two later, you find, like, oh wow, I'm glad I learned that because I had no idea it would actually lend into this thing that I'm doing now. I think badges are going to function in that same way. You're going to credential people, and especially if you can encourage, either through financial incentive or through um, this lifelong learning, to get in there and say, let's learn different things. Do something different, like a chef badge, for example. Um, or a higher education professional match. Do something different. It extends the brain and encourages those same skills that I was talking about before, being adaptable and flexible, um, and encouraging things that, you know, frankly, you might not get in a four-year educational degree. So moving directly into VLE, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, from what I have seen in, for example, just LMSs, Blackboard Canvas, that sort of thing, that just tend to be kind of, kind of flat in a way. Uh, they sort of run up alongside the formal educational opportunities, but they don't really contribute much like in challenge of it or beyond it. And, and those instances that I've seen have not been all that successful. Whereas badges that, that are done in ways that complement or extend or challenge the formal education do it in a really neat way. And I think that VLE offers some ways of being able to do that where you're not just running a badge up alongside the kind of formal transcripted um, educational evidence, but rather uh, putting something else out there that doesn't compete with it, but um, might mean the difference between an interview or not. One of the really cool things that I, I kind of found putting the slide deck together was that I had worked with the All Award program. Uh, they're based out of Ireland a couple years ago on the uh, grant that I was in at IU, and then when I started looking at seeing like who was talking about badges and BLE, it was that <laughs> All Award program, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. You never really know how and where your work is going to end up years later, but that's kind of a neat example. So this is a, an image that comes um, right out of Penn State, because um, you guys have done some awesome work with this, particularly thinking about how badges can be structured in a uh, non-traditional curriculum, but also in a way that recognizes that, that not all badges are necessarily free to you. Um, and I think if we apply this to thinking about STEM education, and particularly with BLE, this is going to help make sense of what is becoming an, an ever big, confusing world of educational credentials um, and the things that go into that. So um, my kind of the final point of all of this and as, as we look more in, and I, I realize that I've talked about STEM education in, in very vague terms and that is on purpose. Um, meaning that I'm not looking to transpose what um, necessarily I personally think about it, but rather kind of open it up um, like I told, I told Chris, I said, you know, my, <laughs> what I try to do is like launch the idea grenade into the audience and then just let it go. Um, so that's why I've talked about STEM in very general ways. Um, but I think one of the more concrete things is, is that we're beginning to have to rethink what it means to say an archive. So I know that for people like me that grew up in the analog age, when you think of an archive, you think of like some dusty library somewhere that just catalogs stuff in case anybody's interested in the future, they can go and hang out. 
Um, well, that's cool, but I don't think that works anymore. And libraries are certainly not being designed and structured that way anymore. And archives are becoming very active, and I think badges show a really neat part here where you can have an active archive where credentials are pulled up and examined and um, questioned even, or you can have endorsements that go with it. And that archive becomes an active piece of this big credentialing and emerging economic um, just change in the world. So here is a place where we can engage with claims and evidence in an active, engaged way. Um, it's non-linear, it's sequential. Um, it can be descriptive, it can be even predictive in some ways. Um, and this is a, an emerging world that I think VLE has in some ways a very, very key piece um, of that puzzle. Um, but again, kind of what interests me, and I think philosophically, is looking at this as you know, no longer as an archive, this dusty place where you can go and find stuff that might be cool and kind of disconnected, but rather the archive is this emerging thing that follows a person from you know, very early on up until their later working years. I can offer all kinds of rich, interesting information about them. Um, and in case you're wondering if I thought about the ethics of that, I've actually written on some of it, on some of it uh, because I think that right raises all sorts of privacy and all sorts of potential ethical problems with this. Um, one of the things that, that really interests me, particularly as we think about the emergence of technology and how that fits with education, and badges in particular, is this idea that we have an implicit utilitarianism. We're approaching these things thinking that as long as we help the best number of people, that even if a few not so good things happen to individuals, it's okay. Um, and there are a lot of examples of utilitarianism and implied utilitarianism in technology that I think are frankly quite troubling. Um, and I think badges are going to have to face those same questions very soon, if not already. So, again, the big point here is, is that I think when we're rethinking the artifact, um, this helps learners remain, remain ahead of automation. They can jump in and in the space of a few weeks or maybe a couple months, they can get a new certification. They can do so at a low risk, fairly low cost um, way to be able to increase their viability in the workforce. And I think that. My, one, of, one of the few things that I have really learned about badges is um, that the badge is really the very final piece of the puzzle. Um, and in fact, the badge is like, in my mind, it's kind of the last 10%. You have to do the 90% of the work thinking about the badge, thinking about the evidence, thinking about the claims, thinking about all the good stuff that we encourage to go into a badge. That's 90% of the work. 10% is designing the badge itself. So I think that if we incorporate those pieces of design into this, then we can have um, a viable economy running up alongside automation and AI. And I think in many ways, we can actually encourage those processes as long as we remain cognizant of the fact that um, work means something to human beings. And having that means something. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential here. So I really appreciate your time today. Um, here is my uh, Gmail account if you're interested in getting in touch. I also have a Twitter feed, um, which is a yeah, kind of hit or miss. Uh, the best way of getting in touch with me is, is through email. Um, I do uh, some consulting, I do a lot of writing, um, and I'm happy to um, entertain any questions or comments. I just talked solid for like 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was awesome. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, really enjoyed hearing your theories on why badgering might be starting to emerge from these other uh, social economic pressures that are happening. Um, do you think in the future that like, instead of going to a, a, a university that, I, I know universities are trying to figure out you know, if a four-year degree is relevant going forward, it certainly it's not financially cost-effective in certain regions of the world. Um, so, do you see uh, education sort of dispersing through maybe badging in some way throughout the kind of the fabric of what you uh, do as a natural part of living in the world or something like that? Sure, I am. So I'm actually. <laughs> I was educated in British universities, so I'm very, um, I like the old school stuff, and so I'm kind of an anomaly here. Um, and I would be, I would, I would lament traditional education going away. Um, 
but I agree that politically and certainly economically it's becoming less viable. Um, I think the badges, at least right now, play a good uh, part in running alongside the formal education and in some ways filling out the um, skills and the specific um, things that students aren't necessarily getting in the classroom. Um, whether or not they would actually replace the formal education, there have certainly been some efforts to do just that very thing. Um, but I think it's very early to say that that would be successful in the long run. Honestly, I mean, kind of an ed psych person would freak out for me saying this, so I'm going to hear study ed psych, just plug your ears for a minute. Um, this kind of makes uh, face validity kind of a neat thing because if, a, if an employer is looking at two candidates, one person has formal education and let's say some badges, but another person has a really robust, skill-based badges, maybe as the mechanism for showing it, which one are they going to go for? And I think that people born in the analog age might look at that and go, well, I'm going to go with a person with a formal degree. But as we get more and more comfortable with this digital thing, I think that, that might actually change. And I think in the next couple decades, having someone where you say, I don't really care what degree you have. Um, I want to make sure that you have these particular skills. I want to make sure that you can do these really hard things and that, you know, I don't particularly care how long you've sat in the classroom to learn. Um, I just want to see evidence that you can't do it. That makes face validity very important. Um, and I think that just helps show that. Um, to my mind, um, I actually still identify myself as being a, somewhat of a skeptic of badges because I've seen a lot of good examples, but I've seen a lot of really bad examples. Um, so I, won't, I don't classify myself necessarily as an evangelist. I classify myself as wanting to see people do the really awesome things that I've seen in a few examples. And I think if those can be done and done well, then that poses, yes, an existential threat to formal education. And rightly so. I slightly uh, disagree with your uh, comment regarding uh, a person with more badges, especially skill-focused, may be uh, more attractive to employers unless somehow there are badges that can demonstrate softer type of skills. Yeah. Writing skills, communication skills, and things like that. Yes. What do you think of that? Yeah, um, I think that right now, um, especially in the human resources context, um, I think that you're probably absolutely right. I think that in the long term, that might begin to change somewhat. Um, the reason I say that is because I have seen a number of people that have had high, high quality um, certifications in IT, but not a formal degree, get jobs for people with a formal degree, but not the certifications. Um, so I think that there is some change that is underway there. I think where kind of the key point to where this plays out is, for example, where university registrars um, are willing to entertain putting social um, credentials on people's transcripts and saying these are considered valid in our university. Um, that might be where kind of the sweet spot to see where this, this ends up. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think, I tend to think that when we're speculating about the near or distant future that, you know, we're, we're all typically wrong most of the time because things never play out as you want them to. Um, but like I said, I mean, for me, coming out of a very traditional background, um, you know, I'm also sensitive to the fact that oftentimes employers, they just, they want people that can do the work and have the skills, and the education is secondary. Um, and I think that badges in their current iteration may not have that evidence rich right now. Um, but the potential is there. And a lot of this just depends on how much organizations or schools or um, traditional organizations, how much time and effort they want to spend building high quality evidence. But I think if they put that in, that could be a, a threat. Um, you talked earlier about attitudinal changes, mm -hmm. and I wondered um, about the term digital badges. So I've had in my work with digital badge, a lot of people say they don't like that term, they think it's juvenile, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you've heard it. Um, right. We start to see other terms enter into this discussion, like connected credentials, digital credentials, micro credentials, that sort of thing. Yeah. So where do you see that going? Do you see the terminology changing? Do you see the same attitudes towards the term digital badges? 
Yeah, great question. So <laughs> our Australian friends hate the term badges. Um, virtually everyone that I've ever talked to uh, that's involved in badges out of Australia, they just hate that term. Um, and I, I find it kind of funny, but it actually serves as a really good, a really good point that uh, these are digital micro-credentials. So if you talk to an Australian about uh, badges, make sure you say digital micro-credentials. Um, in my mind, what we call it is a distant second from what we're doing. And to my mind, we can call it digital micro-credentials, we can call them badges, we can call them whatever. Um, to me, what matters is the claim to what the person knows and the evidence to substantiate it. Um, outside of that, the nomenclature, um, you know, I think you're gonna see a natural kind of struggle with organizations to define for themselves what they consider to be valid, what they consider to be a good way of doing this, and I think you're gonna see that struggle with universities as well. Um, to me, that, what we call it is, is in some ways kind of immaterial to the outcome of what's there. And I think as long as the outcome is a strong, evidence-rich credential uh, that's, that succeeds on its own terms, whatever you want to call it is my I mean. Because like I said, in, in my mind, 90% of the work has to be before you ever even really get to the badge or the micro-credential itself. Because if that 90% of work isn't done ahead of time, you're just wasting your time. I mean, to use a, to use a good term that um, uh, Kyle Bowen uses there at, at Penn State, I worked with him at Purdue, is carpet badging, right? I mean, if you just say, oh, well, you know, you get a badge for showing up or doing this presentation just because, like, nobody cares about that, right? But if you spend time thinking through all the stuff that goes into the badge and you have this really robust program to move within it, then, yeah, you, you can have something that, frankly, I don't, particularly think it matters what you call it, but yeah, I've encountered this, <laughs> that same uh, attitude, and, and especially with our Australian friends. If you've ever had the opportunity to talk to somebody in Australia, ask them about it. <laughs> uh, so this is Tori, I'm sitting next to Emily. Uh, we liked your picture from the Penn State Library. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so those are our badges. Um, we've talked yeah. to you before about, you know, the, we did that webinar for, whatever that group was, higher ed badges, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, so just to, to kind of piggyback on what Emily asked about the name, um, and I've mentioned this in other areas before, but I think it's important, especially when you're talking to a group of people who might just be starting to think about, about badging and designing badges, um, which we've seen a lot of uptake lately in Penn State, um, is, uh, you mentioned people in Australia, don't like them, I don't know why, but people in, People that come from countries where there's a lot of police brutality, like not only do they not like the name, but they have a very strong like visceral reaction to the name and associating with really negative memories from their childhood. Um, so I just always try to be conscientious of that as well and kind of like knowing your audience, right? Just like in all instructional design, know who your audience is. But that's another reason to like think twice about just throwing out the name badges all the time. And I agree that it doesn't matter what you call them because it's the design that matters. But when you are talking to people for the first time and kind of introducing it, and we introduce it as a course integration from the library so you can get information literacy instruction in your course, um, we try to stay away from the name even though the system has a name badge in it when we're first talking to people until we can kind of establish a baseline of the quality before the name because it seems like yep. when the name's introduced before they see the quality, then they align with kind of the this is gimmicky, this is gamey type of uh, reaction. Sure, yeah, and, and actually let me give you a, an example of that. When MOOCs burst onto the scene, um, one of the things that really worried me initially was, especially in an American context, when we cross the border, um, is this a form of neocolonialism? I mean, in a way, are we are we taking this and saying this is what education is, this is what knowledge is, this is in, in a badge sense, this is what this is how you evidence knowledge, right? Um, and I'm very very I'm very leery of uh, not being open to different ways of contextualizing a lived experience, for example. Um, and I'm certainly not, and I think probably most many people would agree with me that. Um, what we want to avoid is a, is a kind of a neo-colonial mindset um, because that's dangerous. And I think with badges too, um, I think that having a very specific context in which the learning is, is achieved 
uh, is it important to avoid those types of things? So that, that kind of falls under the, the whole idea of the attitude changes as well. Um, so that's, a few people have written about that, um, but I don't think education in general has really kind of reckoned with the fact that when we stamp something with a big, well-known American university name, that you know there might be some really implicit power differences and power struggles and power um, that we may not even be consciously aware of, but could be really bad. Um, <laughs> and could certainly limit knowledge. And I, I would think that anybody that cares about um, education and, and gaining knowledge and trying to unravel the strange world we live in is wanting to be open to the other, be open to other cultures and educational systems. Um, so I, you know, I'm personally very, very worried about that. 